Hey guys, welcome back to Magic TV. My name's Craig. It is nine o'clock, which means it's time for an interview. Now today, I'm super excited. This is somebody I've had so much respect for. He is, I, I don't think I'm, I'm downplaying this at all by saying he's one of, one of the, if not the leading touring illusion acts in, in the world. He has been there. He has done that. He's bought the t-shirt. He innovates. He creates. He develops. He's an incredible performer. He's an inspiration to many, many artists all over the world. And he's so busy. I don't think many people perform as much as this gentleman. I've been trying to get an interview with him for months now, but he's normally somewhere in a different country performing or consulting or doing something. So it's a huge honor to have him on the channel. I am, of course, talking about the legend himself, Jamie Allen. How are you doing, Jamie? I'm very well, Craig. Thank you very much for that introduction. It's very flattering. <laughs> it's true, though. I mean... Yeah. You know, you 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 have done so much, and you, it's not like you're long in the tooth and you're retiring. But if you took a snapshot of where you are right now, and you said to almost any magician in the world, you know, if you ended your career and you'd done what Jamie had done up until this point, would you be happy? They would go, "I'd be over the moon." And yet, you've done all of that, and you've only really you've only just got started. I know how many other plans you've got. It's incredible. You know, it's interesting you say that because I often, um, I mean, we'll probably touch on it, but I remember when I finally got my show in Chicago. That was when I said. I'm happy now, you know, everything that I've done, if it all stopped today, I could say that I kind of did what I, what I wanted to do that, you know, when I was a little boy. So yeah, it, it, it is nice, but it's unfortunately, it's kind of an addiction and you just can't stop because you know what it's like in our business. We love it. You know, it's not, it's not really about money. And with me, it's not about, it's never been about fame. It's just a bit about this want to just keep doing new work as best mm. as I'm able anyway. So, you, you know, that's kind of like an ambition thing. You know, I think one of the reasons maybe that you've got to where you are is because you are so ambitious. You're like, right, okay. A lot of people do rest on their laurels, but you get there and you're like, right, okay, so I've done this. What's next? Yeah, it is a bit like that. I mean, I, I certainly can't help it. And it's much to the detriment of those around me sometimes. You know, I, I, I try to find time for myself um, now, but yeah, there's always something. Like we have had a couple of months in the summertime when I've just been working and I, I purposefully didn't take on anything new because I knew that we're about to um, we're about to embark on a tour now um, in the US, which is going to start in November. And um, we've got a, a new show because we've been running our show, I Magician, mm. for oh, a, de a decade, actually. So we're doing a version of I Magician for the first few shows, but then we're transitioning into a new show that's going out. And uh, that's taking up all my, my time at the moment. I definitely want to talk about that. But for anybody who hasn't heard about you, which I've, I've very much doubt there's many people that are watching this that haven't. Well, there'll, there'll be somebody, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, let's give them a frame of reference. Uh, let's start at the very beginning. How did you get into magic, Jamie? Where, where did that all begin? What was your origin story? Um, I was lucky, actually, because my parents were in show business, not magicians. My mom was a singer. My father was a songwriter. My uncle was a comedian. My aunties were dancers. So there was kind of a showbiz feel in the family. And when my parents stopped touring uh, so that I could, they wanted to give me some kind of a, a normal lifestyle. So they bought a pub, which is, uh, I always joke, is their idea of a normal upbringing. <laughs> um <laughs> And uh, they bought this little pub in the Midlands and they knocked out the bar and the lounge and put a little tiny theatre inside that held about 180 people, approximately. Mm -hmm. And um, we uh, we used to have cabaret acts there. And people that will probably remember, you know, back in the day, people like Little and Large and Jim Bowen and people that were at the time on TV, they were friends of my parents because, of course, my mum and dad knew all of these people from the variety circuit. So they used to do them a favour and come down and and do a show in this place and that's where I did my first show when I was eight and it was because I bought a um I, well, I got given a magic set didn't we all when I was five um a Fisher Price magic set actually it's right here really <clears throat> yeah look at this this is actually my old magic set oh wow this is what I got when I was five I've got it out because it's going to form part of my new show Oh wow! That's... Um, so it's uh, but yeah, look, it's got a little draw box and all these little cool <laughs> um, traps brilliant. and things that move around inside. It's really a, it's really a fun little thing. And for a kid, it was more of a magic toy than anything. Mm. Um, and it had this this incredible illusion in it. 
Oh, well. <laughs> Top quality. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, but that was what got me my start. And um, I loved it. And then my parents knew a couple of magicians. When they were coming over, I used to hound the magicians. Looking back, I'm sure that they, they must have either loved it or just hated coming because they knew that this kid was going to come and like stick to them the entire time they were in the venue um but my dad used to say like if you've got any magic tricks you can bring for jamie if you've got anything you can bring for him and so they used to bring me like a book or a couple of uh, you know a couple of old tricks and um and i started picking things up from there and then my big break for me came when i was about nine when i went to an antique shop it, I, i'm i talk about this in my book i went to an antique shop in warwickshire looking for an old top hat um with my mom and um, the guy said, we've only got a magician's one. <laughs> and uh, we said, that's exactly what we're looking for. And we went into this back room. And in this back room, there was this Aladdin's cave. There was an estate of a magician that had, uh, had passed away. And all of his act had ended up in this tiny antique shop in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of Warwick. Oh. And these are, this is in the days before eBay and before any other means of getting rid of this stuff. So it was just sat there. And um, my mom managed to do a deal to take pretty much everything out of that uh shop so we ended up with all these incredible props and you know books that i still have you know i got my i learned from uh this first edition of modern Mag. it's like i've got my whole life i keep hold of these things that mean something to us but yeah, this was the first it. edition of modern magic and that was uh one of my first magic books you know um crazy and i remember learning the past from here and stuff when i was a kid and um yeah yeah, that was a it, that was like my dream come true. We came home with just so much stuff. Wow! So what happened? So you're nine years old. You've been you've got, you've just got, received a bunch of professional quality magic. Where did you go from there? Were you thinking, right, okay, I'm going to put a show together? Like, yeah, where... that was exactly it. I did my first show in this venue that my mom and dad owned uh, when I was eight. Um, I say owned, it sounds like, you know, as if we were wealthy or something. We really weren't. I mean, anybody, you know, like yourself that runs a business, you know how difficult it can be, something like that. And it wasn't, it wasn't all plain sailing. They had good times and bad times and it was never, never easy, certainly. But we used to do, uh, I used to do a show there sometimes on a Saturday night. I would open um, about once a month, sometimes every two weeks. And I would do about 10 minutes at the top of that show. I remember my first ever show was multiplying balls, um, equal on equal ropes, and uh, all patter stuff, because that's <clears throat> what I saw. That's what the magicians that were coming in with those kind of dance floor style. That was the, how magic was back in, in that time period in the, uh, in the 80s. And, um, I, and I did a, a signed note, uh, uh, well, a note to um, Wallet. And I remember I had to, I, I switched the note. You know, I did the missed call of the numbers. That was the method. And... Um, I actually forgot to take the note out of the envelope and I did in fact burn it. And it was a five pound note. Uh, it didn't affect the end of the trick, but back in the early eighties, that was quite a considerable <laughs> amount of money uh, for me to um, set fire to because I was just nervous the first time I did it. But as it happened, I, I didn't even realize that I'd done it till after the trick because the trick finished, the notes back. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. That's fantastic. So, so you're doing shows in this in this venue. So you're getting flight time right from a very, very early age. At what point did you think, oh, okay, I'm going to do this professionally? It was did, never a moment that I didn't think I would do that. It was a very natural step for parents me. Parents and 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 their influence. Yeah, I mean, I I was obviously I when I was eight or nine or uh, 10, I was doing magic because I loved it. I wasn't particularly at that point thinking about a career, but there was never a moment in my life when I was doing it that I didn't imagine that this is what I was always going to be doing. And I certainly didn't think of it in the context that I'm going to do this for a living. I just figured that's what I was going to do. Because to me, I mean, performing in entertainment, in the entertainment industry was obviously a, a way of life for my family. So it didn't in any way seem like an odd job to, to have. Uh, and I had that support. And my parents tried to um, make sure I got as good an education as possible, but I was never great at school. Um, they found out I was dyslexic when I was maybe 14, 15, when it was still a kind of an unknown term, really. They weren't really looking for it the way they do now. And, you know, I never really I never really did great at school. And I knew that I was smart and that I just wasn't great at these particular assignments, a lot of them. And um, I think it was definitely a point where I just felt like I wasn't really trying that much anymore. Interestingly, I never ended up sitting my exams. 
I never set my GCSEs. I don't have any. And it's because I um I had a I, I landed a job as a kind of a red coat at um, a place called Kiln Park in Tenby in Wales. And I was there for uh, 20 weeks for the summer season. And I was like the room compare of the kids room. It was great. And I had I, I got to do my illusion show there on a on a Wednesday and on a. Uh, on a Monday and Saturday, I did a spot in the team show. And on a Sunday morning, I would do a show for the kids. So I was doing magic there, which is why I wanted the job. But I had to leave before my exams. And they let me out as work experience and said, you can come back and sit them. And I never have. I often thought that would make an interesting documentary would be to go back and see how I would do. <laughs> I should probably I should probably call them up and say I want to do it. <laughs> That's funny. And did you ever, before we move on, did you ever, did your parents ever try to move you into other aspects of show business because obviously they were singers and songwriters no no they no i mean i think my mom wanted would have been interested for me to be a musician i had a drum kit i was given a drum kit once to see if i was into that and i was terrible um my dad attempted to teach me the guitar and it just didn't stick with me i was very musical like i i can i, I have um i have perfect pitch like i can hear if something's a fraction out and it's very irritating for me if somebody is not <laughs> not quite on um, and I understand music, you know, mm. uh, but I don't, I can't write it or play it, but I, I get like the orchestration and I understand how it wants to work. And that's all helped me certainly theatrically when I became to start producing shows, I've always understood, you know, <clears throat> uh, the emotion behind it and why it works. Um, but no, they've never tried to push me into anything. I was always a magician and, um, uh, and I never imagined I'd do anything else. I tried to branch out into other things as I've gotten older, you know, try, try my hand at directing, try my hand at producing, and I still produce shows. But, you know, those those things, you know, don't always go your way. <laughs> Not at all. And did you ever, you know, when, when we think about Jamie Allen, anyone who knows you, they think of you as a stage performer, as an illusionist. And, uh, you know, everything that you've said up until this point, hey, you got a chance to go on stage in your parents' venue and, you know, you were, uh, you didn't sit your exams because you were doing your illusion show and you're going on stage. Was there ever a point in time where you were gravitating towards close-up magic? Because you mentioned the past. Yeah, yeah or... I did. <clears throat> I mean, I did like we all did. When I got into the industry, I did anywhere. I worked anywhere that would pay me. Um, mm -hmm. I, I did children's parties, as we probably all did when we, you know, we, we started out and carry on to. And a lot of people are still making a, a killer living, living at it. I actually enjoyed doing kids parties, honestly. Um, <laughs> I did. Um, I used to do close up. I hated doing close up. I have such respect for people that can do it. I didn't like walking up to tables. In those days, it wasn't a cool thing either. Do you remember, Craig, when it was back in those uh, yeah. early 90s when magic wasn't a cool thing? It was just like. It, it, Paul Daniels was the point of reference and he'd been around for a long time at that point um, and, and there wasn't any cool factor to it whatsoever um, and I was getting booked to do these close-up gigs and I remember I didn't uh, I did I I stopped I was doing one at the De Montfort Hall in Leicester and I walked up to a table and I said would you like to see some magic and the guy uh, said how much do we have to pay you to f off and I left I said oh nothing and I left the building I went home and the, the client phoned me the next day to say where were you I didn't get paid I just left I said oh, I just I, I just went I just didn't want to deal with them and I never did another close-up show after that that was the last one. Oh wow wow and and back back in um I, I don't want to say your day and my day but 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 these days everybody thinks of close-up magic it's it's what you go into but i remember when i first got into magic every nobody really thought about close-up it was all i remember one of the first props i ever bought was a chair suspension it was like it yeah. was staged that's what everybody wanted to do back though there was hardly any market for close-up magic when i was young i only went into it because i knew a guy called mark cosby who was doing corporate close-up magic through um uh, through this agency in Leicester and uh, he was making great money and uh, he was one of very few back in those days when you could probably name all of the UK's closer magicians there was probably what, 10 or 15 people that were kind of doing it but it wasn't it, it wasn't a popular thing it was building at that point mm, yeah I completely agree with you yeah so so you we've got to the point where you've left school you haven't had you haven't done your GCSEs you've gone straight into the industry you've gone on park which is a great experience what what steps did you go to then? Because we've already discussed you're really ambitious. You you obviously wanted 
goal, you had goals that you wanted to hit, which we know now that you did hit. But did you have a plan? Did you like, right, okay, I, I'm, I'm not... I did. What, I did. What... My, yeah, my first... My, I did the summer season. I thought, I'm only going to do this one year. My my next goal was I wanted to become the act. I wanted to become the visiting act that came in. So I went and did a couple of showcases, and I landed a season for Haven Warner the next year where I was touring cabaret. So then I was working virtually every night of the week. Um, and that's... I knew I needed flight time with an act. Um, and that's what I did for about three years. Um, and t- uh, that's when I was running around and I, I got into the Pontin circuit because I knew they paid more. So I started um, pushing all my intention uh, towards how do I get those uh, those parks? And I, I kind of tailored my act. I was one of the first to start bringing my own lighting in with me because um, in the, those days there weren't any moving lights, particularly in the venues. I know mean, the odd few had a few. Um, and I bought some <clears throat> Martin Pro 218s, these Robo Robo scans, and a, and a truss. And I used to tour those with me. And people used to describe it as he brings a laser show with him, um, which, of course, it isn't. But that's how they perceived it, these moving beams, because that that was kind of a new thing, the idea of haze and, um, and uh, lights that could be programmed to go with the music was really quite devastating in those days i remember when the lights used to go down at the start of the act and and i kind of had a little light show for a minute that opened the show you could hear people were audibly impressed by it um and that was when i was starting to get into using some tech you know and i started using a television set around that time um as one of the things and i became the guy with the tv and uh, I started trying to find other ways of not just doing just illusions. I tried to find some production to it without doing the same things. Because I was already, at that point in my life, I already worked out that, hey, there's about seven or eight illusion acts on the circuit. And if I were to list everything that they all do, they're probably I probably wouldn't get to seven illusions before I, like everybody had the same kind of act. Yeah. You know, it was uh, and, and that was OK because there was no YouTube and people were seeing it for the first time. But I wasn't thinking about that. And I was thinking about the bookers. You know, how do I how do I differentiate myself from them? Because everybody had everybody had a cube zag. Everybody had a sub trunk. Everybody had these standard things. A few, few origamis, a couple of couple of rich guys with an impaled <laughs> back <laughs> yeah. in those days. Yeah, it's so yeah. true. And I suppose, you know, if you could give anybody advice that's watching this, that's something that you did very early on, which is probably part of your success, which is differentiating yourself from everyone else. How can somebody these days do that? I would actually, I would actually argue that I was trying too hard to be ahead of my time. And I never really reaped the benefits of a lot of them because I always, always trying to evolve to what I thought people were going to want next. Uh, And I've not always been successful. I don't want to sound like I was some sort of guru. Like I knew, uh, I, I didn't know. I just felt that, this I, I felt very early on that the boy girl illusion act dynamic was already feeling dated. The moment that chat show hosts were were taking the mick out of it, or, or it was the butt of a joke, I'm like, well, it's already running to the end of its course. We need to find another way of presenting this. So uh, I, I started doing the illusions on my by myself. I got a modern art and I adapted it so that I could kind of get in it myself. I had a mirror penetration. I didn't use the girl um and then i did the uh then i got the television set and i did that and i started to become the tech and then a few years later i started um doing the um uh, the, the thing which i think most people think of me about is close up ma- magic on camera because I, I i think if i if i um <clears throat> popularized anything in this i think i popularized that as an art form of using cameras for close up I mean, people were doing it but i kind of worked it out really i mean we saw copperfield doing it it wasn't my idea certainly so sort of Doug Henning doing it on his specials, projecting it to screens, but those screens were so incredibly expensive and so big. And there was, and I kind of worked out how to do it on a smaller scale and how to start to fit it into the venues and what the kit was and how to <clears throat> kind of direct myself to do it. Uh, and that was really the big, a big turning point for me because it enabled me to tour all over the world easily and with a big show. And I, I work I, most of my life. I'm thinking as much about the tricks as I am the production value. Like, well, what's the music that goes underneath it? How can we change the lighting for that? How can we um, create that ambience and that uh, depth of feeling? And I started to, I'm a big fan of musical theater. And um, I, I always felt, well, those shows move you to a different place and magic can't do that. Copperfield is the closest I always felt to being able to move an audience through 
magic by telling a story and I started to look a lot at script writing and thinking how can I get a narrative arc into what I'm doing without it getting arty farty without ramming it down people's throats how can I have there be some kind of meaning to a show you know how can people that come away take something with them and I realized that people started to like to learn at a show they didn't want to just be amazed they loved picking up facts that they could take away and I, I was an early viewer of TED Talks and I started to think that's kind of like how part of I Magician came about is there are sections of I Magician that are very much like that you know you, you feel like you're being educated on something and then you see something wondrous and then with luck we tie a few of those things together to, to tie up some loose ends and, and give ourselves some kind of a point uh, or some sort of uplifting feeling. That's great and and you are right you know that, that you were right at the forefront when it came to tech magic and and projecting yeah. stuff on onto a screen i remember many years ago now through rsvp you bought out that set of dvds that basically was it packed here. massive yeah. or um it was yeah, a double I, think, yeah. I think these are the these are like the last four in existence i think <laughs> that's it packs poor plays massive yeah. i love those at the they're time they're unopened i've never watched them well, I watched them and I thought they were amazing and I learned so much. What was your reasoning behind bringing those out? Because you had something very, very unique that very few people were doing. Mm. Um, and by bringing out those DVDs, you were giving people a blueprint to, hey, you well, they were starting to do it anyway. That was the thing. I mean, people, you know, they, they it was it started a trend. It was nothing that I, I couldn't kind of protect it in any way. It was not. I mean, wouldn't it be great if I could say I'm the only one that's doing this and I don't want anybody else to do it so I can reap all the benefit of it as a business model? Wouldn't that be great? But you can't do that. You you get things to yourself anyway, naturally for a while, because it takes a while for words to spread. But, you know, there was, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I did. I was the person that worked out that that cartoon would translate into a a bigger market. And I did that. And when I started doing that on ships, when nobody was doing cameras and I had this this one effect and I'd worked how to frame it and I wasn't just doing it. I'd worked out how to present it correctly. It was absolutely bringing the house down <laughs> when I started doing it. And it didn't take long. It doesn't take long for technicians to tell other performers, oh, he does this. Oh, it kills and then it's not long before people start to just do it anyway it's not my trick so there's not much i could do to to stop that um so i, I spoke to russ and i was get, i was already starting to develop the eye magician show when i did those videos i already had the title um and i said i need to kind of burn the old act really um mm -hmm. if i give it away then i i'm forcing myself that i have to create new stuff and i wanted mm -hmm. to create and, and for a while my, my model was to try and stop uh, people copying was that the, the routines either had to be a so ludicrously technical that people just wouldn't have the ability <laughs> to or, or the time to do it or prohibitively expensive so that they it wasn't easily copied which is a really bad model to go into but i was like this this was something that would give me some degree of protection of these things and i thought if you had either the the, the that the money or the ability to copy them you probably also had the nonce to come up with something yourself yeah um or, or the respect to ask if you can do it um so i stopped going for things that were easy if i was going to create something for the most part um that's not true of everything and sometimes the simplest idea is the best and you do them uh, but i haven't really had a big problem in recent years i used to bother me it doesn't really bother me as much now it bothered me when i hadn't got a, any kind of name or recognition for it and if i did something and i worked it up and then somebody else did it on a bigger platform and got a lot of recognition for it that that could be kind of frustrating and that goes on and my heart goes out to people when when that happens to them that happens too much in our industry and i always feel like teller says um if you uh if you've kind of dug a trick out and you've worked it out, uh, you know, it's, if it's from the past, that that should be yours, you know, that, and, and I've never really understood the, um, the mindset of, you know, we all see it. Something comes on America's got talent or somebody does a, a trick and it kills the next day. Uh, the next day, if you go on any of the Facebook groups, there's people saying, where can I buy this trick? I'm looking to buy this. And I just think that's the last thing I'd want to do is, <laughs> do something that's just been out there like um 
I, I, yep, I've yep. never really got it. It's like a like a tribute act that kills. Like I don't I don't know why somebody would would how how um I don't know I don't I don't understand what they're getting from it. Yeah, yeah, I, themselves. I, yeah, I, I don't. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. And that's what you've done. You created so many unique pieces that are completely unique to you, which is why you are where you are. Well, that's very kind of you. I mean, and, and they don't always work. I mean, that's the main thing is, I mean, there's for everything that has worked, there's like two or three ideas that are just, we've burned so much money on stuff that just never pays off. You know, we spent fortunes working out this trick with cell phones and we never, we only did it twice. It just, it was so complicated and it just never, it just never panned out. And I tend to be attracted to things I was saying earlier that are complicated, <laughs> like complex methods or things that were layered. I was thinking of designing for TV and stuff at that time. So something that couldn't be, you, if you retrace the steps, you couldn't really find the answer because there was the, the, the methods were so layered um, and, uh, and, and re requiring a, an, a small army of people to do something that seemed, you know, I mean, this thing with the phones, I talk about it in my book, you know, we had, you know, we we had we had like twelve people on on three continents in real time making it work. <laughs> it was ludicrous. You know, I don't know. I, I could have just done a torn restored newspaper. Would have killed. <laughs> yeah, but it's that level of uh, innovation that sets you apart from other people. You know, it's that having that ability to take risks and mm. kind of go. You know what? I'm going to I'm going to do this. It might not work. It might work because if you'd never taken a risk, if you'd never done that, then you wouldn't be where you are now. A lot of the stuff that did work wouldn't have even been in your act because you would never. There are a it. few of those things. And I mean, not many of them. Are, most of them I've never put out on YouTube. I, I really didn't need the recognition that much. So I've kind of kept the stuff that's in the live show that is original. We kind of keep it away from it now. There's no reason to put it out there. We're really the only people that are watching it on there are magicians. So. Mm um I, I could try and try and keep it for the show but I, you know i've gone full circle i mean i'm now in you know doing a show where i do there's plenty of things that i do that are, are dealer bought items that we give our own spin on there's plenty of things in the show that are, are not mine and and i enjoy just working out the presentation for them and, and we pepper those with with our own stuff um i don't want to come across as if i've just created all of this original material i've created a few things um, I mean, for me, the big thing was digital art, the iPads trick. That was the that was the turning point for me. I think if you could, you could probably you, 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 anybody that what would you perceive as success? I mean, if you perceive that I've been successful, I think that I have. That's just a perception. I don't feel that way. I'm still just working at it. But I, there was a definite there was a definite change in the wind when I came up with uh, digital art because that was the gift that kept giving because I did that on. What, seven different TV shows, mm -hmm. um, and that was the thing that really got me out of where I was, which was a cruise ship magician into the touring world. Well, um, I was going to actually ask that, of course. Of you know, we got to the point in 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 your career where you you were touring holiday parks, but obviously we know from that you ended up touring cruises and going literally all over the world with your acts. But then at some point. You then transitioned into I, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm a magician. I'm a magician. Yeah, yeah. We, so, we, we, what, what, why, why? I suppose what made you decide to go to that, and what steps did you go through? Well, because just to just to put it in a nutshell, I started off on cruise ships with a big illusion act. I had my like appearing helicopter and things on there, um, and then when I, I then transitioned that slowly over time down to an act that was more based around camera with some illusions. And then I stopped using the girl and at that time, and I was just doing it myself just with the camera. And then I started adding the tech tricks back in. And at that point I realized I had enough just about to start to, I had this idea for eye magician. And then I, I met a guy, Joe Wenborn, who changed everything for me. Um, he was the one who uh, put the first money into it to put it out on tour and got it booked. And we tried it with 13 theatres and we got the the one show uh, with the iPads and that really helped sell. And we did actually mm. quite well that first tour. It was OK. Um, and we did that another two times. Um, the second year, the second year we went bigger, uh, broke even. The third year we lost a little bit of money because we did too many dates and we were all over the place. And that was when I also realised that the UK is not the best place to tour a, a larger magic show because I, I don't think there are many that actually really make much money on that because it's a, it's a tough market in the UK for, for theatre. 
Um, there's not to say that they, 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 they're all failing. They're not, but they're they're tough. You know, I know the illusionists won't do it again. Oh, really? Well, they said they wouldn't do it back then when they toured. I, and that's a different thing from going into London. You understand? Like, if you yes. go into London for a run, that's that's an entirely different beast. But touring the provinces, it's hard um, with magic. It's it's always hard to get people to come out and pay pay for a ticket. Um, yeah. Yeah, so we toured there, and then and then I said we want to get into the states, and we had a failed attempt to get into Las Vegas over a few years. Um, we uh, we almost got there, you know. Um, I had a I had a theater booked at the Venetian Hotel, the Sands Showroom. We had it all contracted, and then there was a slight cl clause in the contract that had to change, um, and uh, that that clause meant that we didn't have the option to automatically re up the venue if we did certain uh, certain business, and as a result of that. Uh, it meant that um, my, my invest my investors one of them one of the investors was not really happy with that because in Las Vegas there's no way you're going to make your money in the first six months a year it's going to be it's a five year plan you know it's going to take that long to build an audience so if we couldn't guarantee that we could keep the venue then uh, we, we were just going to lose money so we didn't we didn't get that and then I got another deal to have another showroom. Uh, there, which I, I'm glad this one didn't happen actually, but we were going to do it because we were just licking our wounds from just losing this other one. And uh, I got offered this showroom um, at the uh, at the Planet Hollywood that had been dark, and then um, uh, and then Chris Angel wanted it, so they gave it to him, which was of course the right move. But um, but, but but right before Chris Angel was announced, I actually had the deal on that showroom. Oh wow! <laughs> uh, but I'm glad it, because we would have failed there, you know, where Chris had the following to be able to do it. I, I'm, nothing like that it, but we were we, we worked out a way to curtain the room down so that we could get the capacity down and we had a good deal because they didn't know what to do with the room at that point um and obviously if i was them i would have said exactly the same thing like yeah of course they have to go that way but we lost another one and that's when i said oh you know i've, I've not really any desire to go to vegas anymore then we concentrated on touring uh it, it, doing more work in the u.s and that's been very good for us actually and that was really where although there are things i think that people might perceive as successful the, the only times it's really worked is when we've worked in the u.s in the cities that's a uh, lot a lot of acts have tried to crack the u.s and they've been unable to and you've actually made that happen and not you know there are acts that have made it over there but it's been part of an ensemble cast and it's like hey we're gonna have this person and this person and this person but you've gone over as yourself and and been very successful over in america i mean was... I'm, I'm told people have told me i'm the first british illusionist to ever do that i don't know if that's true i, I can't believe it is i can't um, think of anyone else well i mean i i always think of piff who's been remarkably successful and he's not an illusionist but like that but remarkably successful so uh by by every measure of a magician i imagine he's probably the most successful um but yeah, I mean, there are things I still want to do in the States um, and it, the, the the Americans like me. But I, this is where I was lucky to work American cruise ships for a decade because I'd worked out how to play to Americans. And I love working to Americans and a favorite audience. They're so giving and they they love the magic. But it's not that easy. People think, oh, they're an easy crowd. They're not an easy crowd at all. Not at all. But you need to understand them and what they want. Um and just because people like something, it doesn't mean they like crap, you know. <laughs> mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. But you, 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 did you ever think at any point, you know what, I'm going to move to America because yeah, you're yeah, many times, many times, I probably would have gone. Is it, my, my uh, it's my my children that keep me uh, in the U UK. Um, so we go and tour over there and we, we come back, but, you know, maybe, maybe one day, you know, I never rule out anything. We never, we never rule out anything, you know, Nat and I, when we talk about it, we just say, we don't know exactly what the future holds. So, you know, we certainly have, we, it's certainly an option to us if we wanted to do it. Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, we'll see what the future holds. I, I kind of like the uncertainty of life. I, I kind of, <laughs> I kind of like that. I don't really know what's going to happen. I like to know what's going to happen for approximately the next year, but it kind of kind of depressing, isn't it, to know what's going to happen the year after and the year after, like it's all set. It's exciting not knowing. It is. It yeah. absolutely is. And you said at the beginning of the interview, you're now transitioning away from I Magician and you're yeah. moving to another show. What was the reasoning behind that? Because obviously 
I Magician as a brand is 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 very successful. You've toured many, many times. A lot of people have recognition of that name immediately. Well, it won't be the end of it. It's we are bringing a new show specifically into Chicago. OK, um, because we are we are touring in the US from the start of November um, for the first two and a half weeks we are doing um some uh a few venues and uh, and then a little sit down in st louis and then after we've done that we are going to chicago for seven weeks um so we have a theater for for uh, november 24 we're going to open we're going to close uh january 7th so we're there for the whole the whole period and because i've been in chicago with i magician um, and because I've taken my immersive magic show, Magic Immersive, the the child of Illusionarium, it has gone into Chicago. I uh, I need a new name, so we needed yeah. a new show, and we had new material that we hadn't used before. So we are we are transitioning it, but th th this show is more of a stopgap. Um, it's not actually like there are things that I've done before in it. It's not a totally new show. There's a lot of new material in there, and we're, you know, and we're working very hard on it still now. And we'll probably still be tweaking and writing it until the night before, because that's how that's how these things roll. But you know, I mean, I know what the show is now, but who's to say if that's exactly what's going to go on stage? Um, you know, I woke up with an idea middle of the night, night before last, and I phoned up Tommy, my right hand guy, um, and I said I've got this idea, and he's like, "That's brilliant." Okay, so that's upset the apple cart. So we've got to change everything to do this um but yeah the uh the 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 actual new show for me will be next year um which is the 63rd minute that's a that's a show that we've been working on with uh tommy and harry de cruz um for a, a couple of years now and that that will be the show which is a real change in direction for me it's much more art based <laughs> okay um and that that that's something we're really looking forward to doing. That's going to be a very different show to what we've done before. Uh, the, the new show is just called Amaze, my new show. And that, that, that's not just a magic title. There is actually meaning to that um, mm -hmm. in the show. Yeah. Well, when, you, when you're working new material in, um, I mean, obviously, you're doing it on a very big scale. But do you have any advice? Because uh, the reason I ask this is I get questions on this channel all the time. And one of the big questions I get is from people that are working pros. Uh, they don't necessarily tour, but they gig. And that they have a new thing that they have worked on. Uh, maybe it's original to them. Maybe it's a variation of a dealer item. And they desperately want to put it into their show. But when they go, to the, they put it into their thing. They go to the venue. And then they don't put it in because they're like, well, you know, it's going to be a stressful situation. Put and it ends up staying in their box for like six months, and then ends oh, up going. No, it's like the same as the prototype that we make to make the trick work. That's still the same thing a decade later, all held together with tape. It's, it, I mean, there's no advice other than there's never a good time, and uh, you have to just try it. I mean, obviously, I, my style, I'm quite lucky because I'll quite openly tell the audience, hey. I'm gonna. Uh, I'm. I'm working on a new thing which I'd like to show you, and you'll be the first ever audience to see it. And sometimes I might say that for the first five or six shows, um, <laughs> but <laughs> I uh, and I just tell them, and and I put it at the right time in the show. Um, but I'm quite honest with the audience, and and I, I've always felt that's worked for me. I just talk to them, and yeah. um, they uh, they're very happy to if they feel. Like if they feel they're in a real conversation with you uh, and you're not just standing on stage going through this motion, they the audience are really excited the idea that you're going to do something that's brand new. They love it. They feel like they're in a special moment. The moment you tell the audience that, they're all kind of like heightened awareness. They they love it. They love mm -hmm. it for the same reason they react so well when something they perceive has gone wrong as we is a plot so we use so much. Um, you know, they feel like, wow, that happened tonight. You know, we've all had that moment when an audience member's come up to you years later, say, hey, I saw your show the night when and proceed to describe something that always happens. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, I think that I've no advice other than, you know, put it in a put it in the position in the show when you can recover from it. Like, don't put it in the final three. Um, and then don't, you know, and then, and maybe be honest with the audience. That's what I do. Just tell them yeah, I'd like yeah. to try something, and uh, and I don't I don't put too much meat on it, and um, I, I, I don't put too much pressure on myself with it either. I also you also have to get yourself to a point of view where you you don't 
you're not too bothered if it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. It's not it's not the end of the world, you know. It's only a magic show. They don't don't get too stressed about it. There's a you know a show would have to go exceptionally badly to to stop you from working ever again. Like, can yeah. you imagine what would have to happen? <laughs> oh my gosh, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, no, that's very true. That's great. So, uh, what I, you know that kind of brings us up to date. And then we know that at uh, Blackpool 2023, uh, you launched your book, Everything. And we're going to be having a separate chat about this in, in, in a while, but I'd like to touch on it right now, if I could. Yeah, the absolutely. Book is incredible. I've, I've, I've had it since Blackpool. It's absolutely incredible. What made you decide to put that together? Because that must have took a long time. And without being funny, you're a busy guy. You've got family. You tour all over the world. You're constantly developing something new, as well as you know taking other bookings outside of touring. Yeah, it was. Kind of, it, it, I started writing notes for it in COVID, and um, and then I was finding in the schedule that I had times when I'm. I have times when I'm working away when there are days that I'm not doing anything, and I just started writing it. But I didn't write that book as a money making exercise. I wrote it because I wanted to write it because nobody else was going to, and I just wanted to put it. I just wanted to put um, you know what happened to me down so that my kids could have it. Um, I felt that I'd done enough when I launched, uh, when I did Illusionarium in the pandemic um, in Toronto um, and then Magic Immersive in Chicago, those big immersive shows. Um, when, those experiences were so rich for me that I felt that I think I finally have a story to tell now. So although the book has, mm -hmm. you know, 13 illusions and, and a bunch of stage magic, it, it really has the blueprints for how I've done the things that I've been able to. And and I do think at this point now I've I've made enough mistakes that I was able to pass on some knowledge that I think if anybody has ever been interested, remotely interested in trying to sell a ticket to a show, I wanted it to be a book for them. Yeah, which a lot of that's a, a lot of people. That's their big goal in life. You know, I'd like to tour. I'd like to have my yeah. own touring show. And that's something that you've you've you know, you've done over and over again over the last many, many years. And the fact no, that, that it, and it doesn't always work, you know. You make money, you lose money, and you, you you can't go into those things as a to make the money. You've got to get into it because you really want to do it, and you see no other no other road to you. You have to do it. Um, and then if you're that kind of person, then I, I wanted to write about that because I think there's precious little on that subject, really, um, particularly from our point of view of how you how do you sell and market a magic show, and how do you make the costs work, and how do you produce it, and how do you tour it. And, what are the logistics like for that? Like, how does it work day to day? And how do you bankroll it? How did I raise the money to do it? Um, that that kind of thing. Which is, uh, you're right. I don't think anybody else has ever spoken about that subject at all. I I'm sure they have. Um, but I, I, I'd like to think that it's it's relevant today. And I think it'll be relevant. I've tried to write things that I think will be relevant in 50 years, frankly, because certain things don't change. Um, there's a plenty of times in the book I've had to reference. This is what how it is right now, and I'm sure that this will <laughs> evolve. But the fundamental rule will be the same. Yeah, uh, you know, I think <laughs> I won't be around in a hundred years to find out if I'm right or not. So, <laughs> <laughs> and did you, you know, you've talked about how you've been on TV an awful lot, and that's helped your career. Um, you know, you you talked about the first time that you were on the one show, and that helped sell tickets. As America is such a big audience for you. Have you ever considered going on like somewhere like America's Got Talent and, and, I, I, and having that showcase? Yeah, I, I have I have no interest anymore in doing one of those shows because I think that they are brilliant and I think they give a real bump to a career. But I'm no longer convinced that they would. I think the best that would happen for me is I would win my own job. You know, I think <laughs> yeah. I'm kind of doing I think I'm kind of doing doing it um yeah what i'd want to get from it um and i'm i'm not sure that i think it's a f fantastic vehicle for people that would need that exposure bump and that lift to try and get them into a better position than they are now but i i, I kind of had done enough tv that it gave me it, it, somebody once gave me the advice to to build slowly you know to build the foundations um and to say you know building it one brick at a time over a long period of time just always doing good work tv radio newspapers good work just slowly just keep putting these bricks in this wall until 
you, you I, I've slowly built a career out of it and it's more solid those foundations because I'm building them brick by brick rather than having a, a sudden hit that goes away you know we all see our friends that uh, you know have had have had success on those shows and then a year later they we're reliving it saying hey remember this last year when my life changed or remember remember you know and, and it's like it's a lot to, uh, psychologically to deal with isn't it you go on that show you get all this exposure then it kind of just drops away and yeah. uh you, you, you and there are people that have come out that have done exceptionally well you know people like ben hart that i think found an audience out of that you know found a found a niche audience and that would be my advice to people going on those shows is try and work out who is your audience and try and play to them don't go on it to win the show try and find out who is it that what makes you different and who is your crowd um and therefore who is going to pay to come and see you you know um there's a great quote i heard recently um what was it the guy oh what's the guy's name harrison greenbaum said said it's at magic live about um being sushi you know you want to be sushi because people some people hate sushi they can't bear it but the people that love sushi they'll go out of their way to eat it they'll 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 they'll, they'll go there on special occasions they'll go there if you could be sushi rather than a burger <laughs> then you know that's what you want you don't want everybody to like you you want the people that do like you to love you um and yeah. I think I think there's definitely some truth in that. I'm kind of general, honestly, um, and because my my appeal is mass market, so I don't know if that's the right thing. But I mean, we're touring theatres and we are appealing to it. We're casting a wide net. And when I look into our audience, you know, we've got we've got date nights. Uh, you know, we've got young families. We've got retired couples. We've got everybody in between in there. Um, so magic is quite cross generational. I think it, it, it seems to appeal to everybody. Um, but yeah that would be my advice and no I, that was a long answer to your question wasn't it craig uh, do i want to do answer. got talent um and the answer short answer would be not really mm, i totally understand i want to ask you one more question before we switch subjects slightly and this is a question i've had from many people on my channel and i think that this is if there's anybody that could answer this it's you how you, one thing that uh, i can see that you're very good at is time management uh, you can't get as much done. As Not you everybody can. would agree with you on that, Craig, if you were in my <laughs> household. <laughs> but from the outside looking in, <laughs> how, how do you balance? This is a question I get all the time. How do you balance your work life and your family life? Because I know that family is very important to you. But I also know that you're touring and you have to spend time working with teams. But like, how Well, you... I mean, I'd better, I'd, I mean, you have to have great people around you. I mean, Nat, my, you know, my, my partner, Nat, she's fantastic. And she makes sure that I do what I need to get done. And she's very aware that um, I, I have things that need to be done. And she checks in on me to make sure that, I, you know, that I'm, I'm a uh, allowed the time to be able to do it because i mean i work work from home and um yeah and it, it, there are times that it gets crazy busy and she's brilliant at helping me with that um and and i have great people you know mm. i have great people around me that um that i work with it's not it's not a one-man show it might be my name on the poster but that's far from it i mean it's a you know it, it's a business and none of it would work without you know nat and without tommy um uh, tommy my right hand um and we got Steve in the States and Joe Wenborn in the UK. And uh, we got Claire Nordbrook, who uh, does all of our graphic and does virtually everything in between um, for us. And, you know, and, you know, our small team, I think it's about uh, finding people that are good at what they do. My dad used to say that to me, you know, surround yourself with people that are better than you at what they do. Like find the best people. Don't try and be a one man band. It's so common in magic to, uh, and we have to be this way. We, we, you know, we, we have to be your own marketing manager, your own salesperson. You know, yeah, you have to. And hopefully, eventually, you get some help with that if you're uh, successful. But that doesn't mean to say you should. Like, if you can get a friend even to want to watch your show, if you can't afford a director, you know, have those people help you. And that helps with your time. You know, after we finish speaking today, I'm on a probably a three hour call, um, which is you know going to be you know with our uh, magic consultant and um that you know and I, I just try to put it in blocks if i can um last night well you know but yesterday was a busy day 
So when you say I'm good with the time management, I sort of think I didn't sleep much last night because I've got a lot going through my head right now because at this exact moment, we are dealing with all the marketing for several venues and, um, you know, we're dealing with the logistics uh, for that, which is, you know, the the trucking and the uh, and the ecom and the flights and that's all getting booked and we're dealing with the show and we're transitioning to this new show and uh yes last night in the middle of the night i'm waking up going oh god what am i you know what what have i missed you know what haven't we done so um i set office hours that would be the best answer i, mm. I try to set myself time that i'm going to work from here to here but if i sit down and there's nothing to do then i, I stop <laughs> yeah <laughs> make right, myself right. do something and I, I, before we finish, I want to talk about one other venture and uh, maybe just touch on this. Because at Blackpool 2023, as well as having the book Everything, you also launched um, a, a new innovative um, sound lab app, uh, you know, that you're doing with who I consider to be one of the best developers in Magic, uh, Joshua Riley. And, yeah. and that's been taking the world by storm as well. I mean, we just talked about how busy you are. And then it's like, well, you know what? I'm going to set up another business. Why not? Why so? I, I did that to solve a problem that I was just like, uh, why wasn't it? So it's Adam Heppenstall and I decided to start it. Um, we were, Adam's an incredible craftsman, great thinker. I've had a long-term relationship with Adam, great friend of mine, a uh, great craftsman. Um, we were going to, uh, we decided, I was always getting asked about building a close-up table for magicians um, with the camera rig. And um, so Adam and I set about to design one that was like the ones we were using, but refined. So as an actual product rather than the things that we put together for ourselves and make it like as good as it could be. And uh, along the way, we said we should we should really develop an app to make the camera work for this from your phone. It would just be so much better. And um, and that's what we did. We brought in Joshua. We formed a business called IQ Pro, um, which is like QLab, but it's on your iPhone. And in many ways, QLab is extremely good. It's also very expensive. Um, but what you really need, because the phones are so good on an iPhone, the, the cameras are so good on an iPhone. I said, wouldn't it be great if you could get all your video playing from your iPhone, your audio playing from your iPhone, use the camera in your iPhone over the table and just plug in an HDMI cable that sends the sound and the video on the cruise ship or the club or the theater you're in to the screen and to the speakers. Because in that way, you could just have your phone with you or a phone. And and uh, we use these uh, flick buttons, these long range flick buttons that are incredible. I don't have one next to me um, that, that are in incredible. And because they operate on this long range Bluetooth, which is unlike your grandfather's Bluetooth that used to break down, like long range Bluetooth with flick is unbelievably powerful. Uh, you can operate this thing outside the theater. Anyway. It's tiny little coin buttons. And and now we've got this incredible app that runs, you know, that, that can do all of these incredible things that QLab can't do, like dynamic zooms. You know, it can zoom around and follow your action on the table. It can, uh, it brings up all your graphics, allows you to create graphics. You can create slides, lower thirds in there with it. It does all of your audio, all your fades in, fades out. Uh, it now is, we're about to release our update with DMX Lighting, uh, which has a 8, 000, up to, with 8,000 fixture library for universes of DMX. So again, all can be controlled wirelessly from your phone. Um, so you can control all your moving lights. You don't need to control any of those things. Like you can, if you just want to play a bit of sound for your show, it's the, uh, if you want to play a bit of video uh, in your show or a pre-show or have a background running, or if you want to do a close-up trick, you've got the entire thing on your iPhone. Um, and it's it's the best system in the world for it right now because it's it's more cost effective than any competitor and it does more than any competitor for a performer. I'm not saying it's QLab because QLab is a different beast. but QLab is a is requires a high-end Mac, requires a lot of peripherals, requires a very expensive license, and it's fantastic, but it's more than most of us need as a performer. We need to be able to control our sound cues, our audio cues. We need to be able to control our video. We might want to use a live camera, and we've got some fantastic features in between. Oh, you can add a, a, your name in 3D and move it around, add it to a background. We have a library of content that you can access, and um, it's the best in the world, and it's cheaper than everything. You know, because it only, you know, but when we do a sale on it, it's like it, it costs uh, about two thirds of the nearest competitor, you know. 
Uh, so it's a it's a phenomenal product, and I'm really really proud of Joshua and Adam. They've worked so hard with it, and we've got some really exciting updates. That I know you know what's coming down the pipeline with it, and um, you know we're really excited to to share those with people. And it's built a nice little following actually. We we could do with more. You know, we, we could do with more. It's a we, we're still building the business. We're still building our army, but we've well, got a lot of great people. It really you know, right now, there's a lot of great people out there that are using it, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, nightly. Um, Pete Furman's using it at the moment on his tour. You know, Paul Zerdin. Um, you know, we've got a bunch of the people that are on there, like Tom Crosby is using it constantly. Uh, Tom Wright. Uh, I mean, and this, the, the list goes on and on. Michael Fix used it the other night, the Magic Circle. They've started using it to uh, run the... Uh, stuff for the show for the Kavari show they're using iq pro That's and cool. um it's it's just simple it's just it's simple to use and, and it's intuitive um you, you know you can you can kind of work it out but it's incredibly powerful but it's it's only as powerful as you need it to be mm. yeah fantastic and and like 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 you say you just launched it at blackpool this year so i mean it's only been around for what six months and it's already being used by so many people yeah yeah it's it's been it's been wonderful the pickup for it worldwide has just been delightful it's been a, a wonderful to deal with and uh and joshua's a genius you know he he's great at it because I, I me and adam know what it needs to do that's how our relationship works because we've worked with show control for so long that we know everything that it needs to be able to do um but uh, you know joshua makes it work i don't know how any of it works it's like magic craig <laughs> i don't know how it works but it does. <laughs> I've had that experience with Joshua many times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He'll just show me something and I'm like, how, how would you even consider thinking of this? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he's a really good guy. Really good guy. So let me ask you one more question, Jamie, because I know you're busy. I want to ask you one more question, which is, and, and this goes back to what I said at the very beginning of the interview. What's next? And what I mean by that, like I said, if we took a snapshot of where you are right now, most performers worldwide would be happy ending their career at the point that you're at right now but during this the course of this interview you've talked about shows that you're just about to embark on you've talked about a new show that's coming next year that you're working on you've talked about where you're taking um iq pro you've talked about so many different things like is there anything left on your magical bucket list that you want to hit? What are your goals over the next few years? And 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 is there a do you, can you foresee a time where you kind of go? I'm... I've got there's 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 one thing that's uh, that is sitting out there that I haven't done that. I mean, I'll just say it here that I will do is I want to play Broadway, um, and and I will play Broadway at some point. That's my that that's the the that would be the next major thing for me if I, that would be something that i would go well if that if i did got to do that that would but equally if that doesn't happen but that's what i that's what i would like that's, that's what i'd like to do um i might I might do the west end at some point though it's funny that because i live so close to london i don't it doesn't hold the allure for me that mm. broadway would um, but we'd like to build on our touring market in the u.s up until now, we've done more sort of sit down experiences where we've gone into a place for one month um, and that's been good for us. But we would like to tour. So we're just dipping our toe in the water in November and doing a few theatres more than we normally do just to see how that feels for us um, and what it's like going into the, you know, going into those venues night after night. Um, so that that's going to be a new experience for us. We're doing that on a slightly smaller scale at first as well, just so that we can uh, manage it because I've made that mistake before where we booked too many and we lost control of it. So we're doing um, we're doing three theatres in a row. Then we're doing one theatre for six performances before we go to Chicago. And it's going to be enough for us because we're already booking um, tour dates in the US. We've already got some next August. So we're, we're kind of a lot far out, but that's where we're looking to build the more substantial next tour. But we're kind of going out to learn in November, a little under the radar, really. Um, uh, and then and then we're going to then we're going to go into Chicago and we'll do the best we can there. Different show in Chicago, because last time I was in Chicago, we did uh, we did the Harris Theatre um for two weeks as many many performances um multiple performances a day sometimes as many as three a day in this theater that was 1550 seats and um 
it was the best experience of my life because we did such great business there we did about i, I think like 85 90 percent capacity average business over the run which was just remarkable um and uh, and i think it was the highest selling magic show that chicago's ever had and we uh, and because of that we got a lot of press and this show this year I'm so excited. We're going in for seven weeks, so many more shows than I've ever done in one location. So it's going to be in the realm of, you know, 50 to 60 performances, um, more so. But we're going into a much smaller theatre that actually caps out at, like, 240. And it's going to be a much more intimate show, tiny little balcony, uh, beautiful, and like a theatre that shrunk down. And I'm so excited to do this new show that's going to be much more... Uh, intimate and more immersive because of it you know the ticket price is a fraction higher the average ticket price is a fraction higher because of that uh, but uh, it, because it's a smaller show with that smaller crew and everything we can afford to do it that way and it still actually works out for us uh, you know uh, really well so I'm hoping that that's a success because that's something I've been really passionate about for a while that's amazing that's that's wow, wow. but who knows you know, I mean, I'm, I'm okay. Like, I've done enough in my life. I'm happy with what I've done. And I'm also, I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm not. There's no, it, it, I don't really have much, much anything in the way of ego, really. I just have a desire to want to do it, and uh, and, and it might all go terribly wrong. <laughs> but it's uh, there's still time. <laughs> yeah, but you um, know, it's what we talk, spoke about earlier. You know, yeah. taking risks. You've got yeah. to do that. You know, you've got to do that if you want to get to where where you're at. Yeah, well, if you're only here once, aren't we? And we have to. Uh, well, that's what I believe, anyway. Uh, we're only here once, and uh, I, I'd rather, I'd rather fail and try. That's how I've always been. Yeah, I'd rather, I'd rather try. Um, and I look back and go, well, I gave it a hundred percent. Then I wish I had. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm. We did the best we could. <laughs> that's all we yeah. can ever do, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. And um, you know, you mentioned earlier on about Vegas. Is that something that you'd still like to try and? push towards or is that kind of itch being scratched and you're moving in different directions now i can tell you that when i was in vegas uh, i was offered a showroom uh, a good showroom in a good theater and uh i haven't thought much about it since <laughs> so well, that's, 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 that's probably it i don't i don't think so never i never say never you never know um i, I at the moment I don't think so right now. And I'm also worried about the market in Las Vegas at the moment. I mean, people are not, it's not, it's not breezy out there right now. It's not, it's not as easy to sell tickets in Vegas as it once was. And there's too many shows out there and it's not, it's hard to make, it's hard to make money in Las Vegas, really hard. Um, and uh, Vegas is my favorite place on earth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I absolutely love it. So why wouldn't I want to work there? But, I, but you also, the crowds in Vegas are not like your theatre crowds the rest of the places. You know what the crowds there are like. They've kind of just wandered in that day. It's a little, you know, I, I think we as magicians are more attracted to it. I think I was certainly attracted to it because of its history. David Copperfield, you know, Penn and Teller, Siegfried and Roy, the greats, Lance Burton were always there. Um, and uh, now it's uh, it's different. And um, I, I don't know what Vegas will look like when Copperfield and Penn and Teller are no longer there. And that mo that day is coming at some point soon. It's I don't know when, but it's not. Yeah, yeah, I know. I mean, I'm a I'm a huge fan, you know. Obviously, and when I worked on Illusionarium, and um, you know, and I got to uh, I got to work with David Copperfield, um, and that was like a dream come true for me. And also, you know, uh, Penn and Teller, and I did, you know, I I, I talked to Penn a bit now and, and and those guys are fantastic i mean i got a, i got a most wonderful day when i was uh, doing magic immersive in chicago my show there and uh pen flew out to do a lot of press with me and we were going around all day these various in a car these various radio stations and tv stations and that was what a hell of a day and i was looking back going wow what a what would what would little me have thought about this this is awesome just That's laughing and shooting I mean, the breeze with these people are just fantastic and um very down to earth and um i found that you know people like that my heroes like you know uh, and on some level friend maybe you know or friendly you know these people that i've respected so much they are um you know they say you never meet your heroes and i certainly haven't been disappointed they've all been absolutely wonderful and um and that that's a you know that's something else that's my that, that my career has given to me is the you know mixing with these uh, wonderful fascinating people that i just uh, could never have dreamed of 
you know, even as much as a decade ago. That's... It's all come around in a decade for me, Craig. Everything a decade ago was when I first started touring I Magician. Everything is in the last 10 years. When I was, I'm, I'm, I'm just 45, so 35 when I started that. And I started kind of getting into it late, but I was trying to build a foundation. And um, it's all in the last 10 years. Um, I mean, that's... I just hope the next 10 years aren't boring. Well, I mean, yeah, yeah but even, even up until, you know, 10 years ago, you'd still achieved so much, you know, you would, you would, you, you know, th there's some people and they're, they're sitting here watching this and they're thinking, you know, my goal would be to be able to travel the world on a cruise ship doing. Yeah, my no, I get, I get those messages all the time. It's a phenomenal job and I still do it by the way. You know, I, I still work for, I, I only work for Royal Caribbean, but I mean, when I'm not working, I will nip on, we're going on Royal Caribbean tomorrow. Um, Nat and Nevada and I, we're going on the Anthem of the Seas. Wonderful. We're going there for you know four nights. I'm going to do a show. The family's going to love it, and um, you know we'll, we'll eat well. We get a nice suite on there. Royal Caribbean really look after me after all this time. They're just it's lovely to uh, be on the, those ships, and it's so great big theatre, you know. And it's that I love the shows on there. Royal Caribbean are phenomenal. They have like you know the, the shows that they have, are, you know, proper shows. They're not like cruise shipy at all. They're um, like the show the night before me is we will rock you you know that's an installed show on there it's the official production you know official directors everybody cast by the london you know company it's all uh you know it, it's incredible and um and then the next night it's me with my pelican case <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing though but it's great it's great that you built up that relationship with them the, yeah. you, they 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 they, you know, they look after you so much. And that's... They're lovely. They're absolutely lovely. I can't say enough about them. And yeah, uh, and, yeah the, the cruise ships were great. But I mean, I, I just, I needed, I just need diversity. I need, I just get bored too easily. You know, you know what? That's one thing that I've noticed about you, Jeremy. Obviously, you know, I've, I've really enjoyed doing this interview because although I know of you and we we chat, I don't know you very well. So I'm learning an awful lot through this interview. But one thing that I've always noticed is... Everybody I've spoken to, they always speak so highly of you. And a lot of the time when I interview people, it's like, oh, you're not interviewing that person. You're not interviewing that person, are you? You've never, like, as far as I can see, you've never burnt bridges. You've never I'm left sure, somebody I'm with sure a side not to. I mean, I'm, there, there's definitely some people out there because there's always those ones that the moment I post anything, you know, YouTube, dislike. You know? <laughs> Like, yeah. like the instant that they're there yeah. just to just to do it um so there's obviously there's obviously must be some <laughs> somebody but not to my knowledge i mean i've uh, I, I i i really hate confrontation like that i don't really want to uh, fall out with anybody and i try try not to you know get myself too involved <laughs> in things that don't concern me um and uh uh, and I also try to like I get excited about what I do there are times in my life that I've been worried that because I'm excited about something that I'm doing and I want to tell people that it could come across as egotistical um and I certainly uh, have never meant it in that way it's just because I've just gotten excited about this new thing um and uh I, I've I, I never I never had any desire to be famous when I was growing up like I never chased trying to get onto the tv when I was young or anything like that I just I wanted to perform and my heart is always with will always be with live theatre and um, my want is to sell tickets and unfortunately I have to try and do some TV and other things in order for that to in order for that to happen I have to have done TV and a lot of press in order to get the visa that I require to work in America yeah. <laughs> all of these things just feed the other you know and, and we'll, no doubt we'll do a a bunch of tv this year uh, out in the states to promote the shows but I, i've never i've never particularly liked any of that stuff mm, <laughs> i can imagine i can imagine well jamie this has been an amazing interview um so first of all people can buy the book if, if they like and i'm i'm going to do a separate review on this obviously very soon but people can buy the book and find out more about it and read reviews from people like Penn and Teller, uh, Pendulette and so on, Andy Nyman, so on and so forth. Yeah. You can go to Jamie. Well, the Pendulette review probably doesn't have much weight right now because I've just told you I know the guy. So they probably think, <laughs> oh, it's just, it's just fed him me. But, <laughs> but, um, but no, but I mean, yeah, people like you can read the reviews from Andy Nyman and stuff and people. And it's been reviewed from, it's been reviewed multiple times. It's, the website's dead easy if you, you want to find it. It's yeah. uh, 
Jamie Allen, if you can spell Allen, uh, A-double-L-A-N, it's yep. jamieallenbook.com. And so, I'll put a link in the description down below. Yeah. And if people want to know more about uh, your close-up tables and all the technology that you and Josh and, uh, have been working on, what website would they go to to check that out? Well, we would go to IQ Pro. Uh, you can go to IQ, so it's like the letters, iqpro.app. Um mm -hmm or iqproapp.com. I think we've got both. Or you can go to the App Store and just search for um, IQ Pro Show Control. Uh, yeah. You have to put IQ Pro, you have to put Show Control in sometimes because there's a lot of things that are IQ tests, you know, that come up and you have to scroll otherwise yeah. to find it. But IQ Pro Show Control in the Apple App Store um, is a free trial. You can download it and have a look at it. We've got a great Facebook group called the, uh, if you're looking for, look us up on Facebook, there's a, a users group, IQ Pro users um and you can join there and we've got a great community of people that are helping each other out and you know offering advice on how they're doing it and um yeah and iq pro will will you know you know, will change the way you run your show you know people think they don't need it till they use it and then they can't go back it changes everything production value is everything wow wow okay that's amazing and i have a big uh, a lot of people that watch this channel i have more viewers for this channel in america than I do in the UK by far. So if people are over in America and they want to catch uh, your tours over the next couple of years, or somebody's in Chicago and wants to watch uh, your new show that's taking place over in November and December up until January the 7th, where would people go to find out all about your tour dates? They could go onto imagicianlive.com. Um, imagicianlive.com will have the full listings of everywhere that, we are there are other new sites being set up for the new show but everything will be on that site amazing amazing, amazing. we actually as we're speaking today craig that show has not gone on sale it will go on sale at the weekend and it will all be announced so it'll all fit together beautifully absolutely it will because this is going on over the weekend so this yeah. is <laughs> synergy that's amazing jamie that's in fact in fact craig you are you are actually the person announcing it here that's it is, i haven't we haven't told anybody because what's the point in telling anybody till you're on sale i'm like people say oh i want to tell everybody i'm excited I'm like don't tell anybody until they can buy a ticket yeah like, that's one thing i've learned there's a piece of advice <laughs> that's a very good point yeah. a really good point so go, go anybody watching this go buy a ticket if you're anywhere near any show that jamie is doing it is incredible also go check out the book look for a review on magic tv soon go check out uh, everything that jamie talked about but honestly i want to say one more time i know how busy you are i know how much you have going on we've been trying to do this for a long while so thank you so much for finding oh, so, thank you thank you i genuinely i mean that thank you it's, it's really nice to uh to sit and chat about this i always feel a bit uncomfortable just talking about myself you know like it's a bit it was, it was a bit self-congratulatory and i don't really you know I, I appreciate it very much. And, uh, and and if any of you have managed to watch this all the way through, like, well done. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of people will have, and I know they will have had a great time. But I want everyone who's been watching this to leave a comment down below. Let Jamie know what you think. That would be amazing. Leave a comment down below. And, uh, and yeah, I'm going to see you again very, very soon on this channel. But Jamie Allen, one more time, thank you so much. Thank you, Craig. No problem. Guys, I'll see you again soon. My name's Craig from Magic TV.